haven't been living up to my name. What do I mean by that? Well, it's kind of embarrassing when you tell people you're a DJ, and when they ask you, so, where do you DJ at? And you have nothing to tell them other than, well, I, I DJed at some talent shows back in high school, and my friend's brother's graduation party, like, 11 years ago. Yeah, so things kind of got put on hold as far as my DJ career in the name of going to college and getting a real job, which was probably a good idea in the long run. But I always told myself, once I get out of college, once I build this new computer, I can have that laptop and just dedicate it to DJing. The problem with that was the laptop was being replaced because it's kind of a piece of crap. So wanting to use that for DJing is like saying, all right, to hell with DJing ever again. However, luck changed this year when I found this computer on the side of the street and I turned it into what I call the scrap top. It's a desktop to laptop conversion. And that's my new DJ computer now. So that really revitalized my wanting to get back into this stuff in a roundabout way. I know it's kind of weird to use this obsolete technology, but somehow it's better than the laptop. So with that in mind, here's a little bit of a backstory. So I, I just did my first DJ gig in 10 years. It was at a co-op Halloween party. And the backstory of how I found this place was, it was through one of the clubs at my college a few of the people in the club were living there. And they said, yo, we got this phenomenal Halloween party that we host every year. You should come to it. I'm like, heck yeah, I like partying. So I went to this party a couple times and it was great. They got, you know, cause I'm a DJ, I'm always looking at what they got set up. They had a, like a computer and people would volunteer to go up and like DJ off of like a Spotify playlist. And I'm like, oh, that's all right, but you know, it'd be cool if they had an actual DJ. But at the time my setup was still not up to speed like it is now. So this year I reached out to them and said, hey, I got this sweet setup, I want a DJ at the Halloween party. And they're like, great. And everyone who was like originally gonna DJ, they agreed like, you know what, just, have your, have your moment, it's your night. You can DJ for the entire five hours. And I'm like, great, I'm a DJ for all five hours. So that was what the plan was like a month ago. The night before the event happens, I'm told that other people also signed up to DJ. I'm like, okay, fine. Because I was originally planning to split the time anyways. But they didn't tell me that they also signed up to DJ at the exact same time slot that I'm supposed to go on. Because I told them, you know, if I'm going to DJ, I want to go for two hours. And I want to go in the latest spot because I built this awesome light sign that says my name on it. And I want it to be visible in the night. On top of this, my friend who was going to drive me to the event bailed on me at the last second. So I had to take everything on my bike trailer, which actually was what I wanted to do in the first place. And that was really fun because my bike trailer inadvertently was exactly the perfect size to fit everything. Like the turntable case fit within like one inch between the wheel guard and the mixer case is like the same width. So that was great. I hauled it all like 10 miles with no problems whatsoever. So I get to the party, not knowing like when these people are going to go on and nobody's there. It's like three o'clock. So I'm like, you know what, if no one's here, I'm just going to start setting up and, and putting some music on. And that was good. I, I played like some background music from a cult's nightlight album and people liked it. So six o'clock comes around, which is when I was supposed to get on. And then these people come up, they're like, Hey, we signed up to DJ at six o'clock. I'm like, well, that's funny because I was told I'm DJing from six to eight. So my plan was to play like background music for the first hour. 
and then like get into the mix and then really get down to it. And these people came up to me like right in between the, the two halves of my set. So the girl's like, I got some like R&B stuff, like dance music. And I was like getting the auxiliary cable out, like, all right, I'll, I'll let you go on in a bit. And like, that was right when I was starting the real set. So I played like Britney Spears, Baby One More Time. And then I mixed it with Maroon 5's This Love because the they both sound similar, like with the piano and everything. And then like, as soon as I played This Love, I noticed there's people dancing. I'm like, all right, this has never happened before. I'm DJing at a real party and there's people dancing. Now, granted, this party wasn't that big. There were probably not more than 20 people there. So to have, like, five people dancing, like, the entire time was a huge accomplishment for me. And I just really... What what it did to me was it put so much pressure on me to, like, I better keep these people satisfied or else they're going to come in and want to take me out. Especially since I was just barely starting my set. Like... I have not even gotten started and they're already trying to kick me off. <laughs> like, come on, I, I hauled this like 100 pounds of equipment here on a bike trailer. I'm in a freaking DJ, okay? So as I was just getting in the mix, I guess they liked it enough that nobody bothered me the rest of the night. I just went until like 9.30. I even performed some of my own songs. And it was great. I guess the pressure of having people that also wanted to DJ at the same time. It put pressure on me to like make sure people were dancing constantly. Like I felt like I was just beating them over the head with like danceable songs. And it kind of took away from the creativity of my set because I had other ideas I wanted to do, but it went all right. It was good. One of the highlights, one of the hilarious things I think was like in the intro part when I was doing the background music, I put on, like I knew at some point I had to transition, but I wasn't sure when. So I put on like a song from the Command and Conquer Red Alert soundtrack. But I forgot the fact that when I recorded that thing off the PlayStation, for some reason, just like as an inside joke to myself, because on one of my tapes I have that song and then I have a Big Daddy Kane song right after it. In the digital file, I put the Big Daddy Kane song right after the end of the song. So the song's ending, it's fading out. And I'm looking on Serato like, there's this extra chunk of music at the end. I'm like, hmm, what's this? Here's a little something that I bring to you, kind of mellow. And I just want to say hell. I'm like, oh my god. They like totally caught me off guard. They probably caught everyone else off guard. So Big Daddy Kane's Taste of Chocolate kind of segued me into starting playing like the actual set instead of just background music. So I was just like laughing my ass off because that was just so funny. So then I started playing some like hip hop songs like Trigger Man because that kind of sounds like a Halloween song. And then like, then I got into the dance set as I described earlier. Another thing I wanted to make absolutely sure of because the last time I'd gone to this party, the party went absolutely bananas when the song Bossy by Kellis and Too Short came on. So I knew I had to play that song, which was really funny that one time because I had become like a real fan of that song like the previous year. So I was like in that crowd too, like singing along. And this girl was like, who is this guy? He knows every word of the song. <laughs> like, of course I do. I love that song. So I made absolutely sure to play that song, and they loved it. Like, this is like an aside. Like, I realized, me personally, like, as I got older and, like, I feel like I've become more sensitive and more aware of my feminine side to the point where like all these girly songs like sound awesome to me like bossy like uh big mama thing by lil kim like the entire like discography of the cheetah girls and i think i realized this when i was at like how the west was one concert and baby bash was performing cyclone and i like 
to my friend and I'm like, why is it that all the songs I like are the ones that all the girls are dancing to? Like, like I have that like Dexter and Dee Dee like paradigm in my, in my brain. Another perfect example of this is when I bought Curtis Blow's Ego Trip LP at a thrift store when I was like a teenager. I absolutely hated the song Falling Back in Love. I was like, what is this bullshit? Why is there an R&B slow jam on a hip hop album? And if I listen to the album today, that's my favorite song on the album. Like, how did this like flip like completely? That song's great. I don't know, I guess just, I don't know, puberty and my sensitivity and developing an ear for music or whatever. Where was I going with this? Uh. Yeah, so I did the gig. That must have been like this, the the shortest three and a half hours of my life because I was just so focused on mixing. Like, I feel like I wasn't even paying attention to anything. Like, someone could have walked up, like, right behind me and, like, lit a stick of dynamite and walked away and I would not even notice. The other cool thing about this gig was it inspired me to build that light box that I mentioned. It inspired me to build a mic stand because I was performing my own songs and scratching at the same time, so I needed a mic right here, which might have not been good placement because the mic was like blocking my head from view of the dance floor right there. So it was all right. I didn't have to bring a sound system because they had like this big Bluetooth speaker just on the table, which was plenty good for the amount of space and people there. I mean, part of my brain, I guess from like when I first got into DJing, I was really obsessed with gear. Like part of my brain thinks you need two JBL JRX 225s, no matter what size the building is. So I myth busted that. So the night went really well. It was great. I was satisfied with how it went. People loved me. And uh, I guess I went home feeling a little disappointed because, well, one, I expected a lot more people. I guess because of the previous year, maybe there were more people or maybe it, it seemed like there were a lot more people because it was inside. But I was imagining like 30 to 50 people and there were like 20 people. The other thing was, I guess having not done actual party for 10 years, like I had all this anticipation built up like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm finally getting back into it. Like I spent like months and months at work, like daydreaming this gig and like imagining like sets I could put together and and like finally actually getting there to do it. It wasn't that big of a deal. Like it wasn't like this gigantic fanfare that I had hyped it up to be in my mind. So yeah, I guess I just left a little underwhelmed, but after sleeping on it a bit and thinking about it, it was a good night. I mean, I don't need to be hard on myself for that. So that was my first gig in 10 years. It was good. Hopefully I'd do some more. And uh, yeah, that sign, um, I'm posting a video on how I built it on Greens and Machines. So we can check that out and the mic stand and I also made a tip jar, but I didn't get any tips, but it's all right. I had a good time. It was a fun, it was awesome. Just mixing for three hours straight. I didn't know where to throw this in the video, but I have the footage of the first gig I ever did. It was also a Halloween party, but it was for like a children's Halloween carnival. And I had like just started DJing like not more than half a year prior to this. I was like a freshman in high school. And like the biggest takeaway from that gig was I didn't realize Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice wasn't age appropriate. So the lady in charge got mad at me. <laughs> but just lo looking back at my footage, and my commentary on it, I was just laughing so hard. 
because I said, oh, well, at least it's not like I played f the police by NWA. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Man. I forgot how much being a teenager sucked. I was, I was not mature enough for that profession back then. I was not interested in playing music for other people. I was like a real like diehard KRS-One, real hip hop loyalist, like, fuck all that bullshit, real hip hop. I don't give a shit if I don't make any money. I only play real hip hop. <laughs> Anyways, my voice is giving out, so uh, this video is over. All right, peace. It's not like I played Police by NWA, which by the way is an awesome song. <laughs>